Hi, I'm Keith McCullough, and welcome back to another Real Conversation, where it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome Roy Sabak, who is the founder and CEO of Gold Money. That's a company that you've seen Josh Crum from. Now, Roy and Josh, partners for how many years now? Almost a decade. Almost a decade. Yeah. So that, that, that on, on Wall Street, even though it's not a Wall Street company, that would, that would be classified as a very long period of time. But congrats on everything that you guys have built so far. Thank you, and thanks for having me. It's really incredible being here. It's, it's, uh, I've been trying to track you down in particular for a long time, so when you ping me, that saved me a lot of time. Um, maybe just a little bit of, of history and, and melding you know, your thoughts on gold into the founding of Gold Money so that people just have some background. Yeah, sure. So I, I grew up in, in finance. I've been uh, investing in the stock market since I was a young boy, 12. Uh, and I had the opportunity to have a few uh, good mentors in Southern California that taught me um, essentially the distress, long, short game, specifically uh, bankruptcies, reorgs, spinoffs, things like that. So I grew up with a traditional uh, Graham and Dodd background, bottom-up okay. value investing. Um, you know, I, at first I did try a lot of different things, but nothing really made sense to me until I used that prism to understand markets. And then once I got into that type of investing, um, because I didn't have a lot of capital, I really gravitated towards uh, distressed, mm -hmm. where you could buy these 10 cent dollars or these cigar butts, as Graham used to call them. Um, when I started investing in distress, I think a lot of things started to come together for me intellectually. The first was that uh, you, it really pays to, to think in a contrarian way. Uh, every year I would see these companies that would file for bankruptcy, trade on the pink sheets, have a queue at the end of their symbol, and most of the institutional investors would sell at that point. Mm -hmm. But there was sort of this cadre of long, short guys, distressed investors, distressed shops that specialized in analyzing companies at that moment onwards. Mm -hmm. And really learning about the Chapter 11 process in the US, uh, especially in places like Delaware, is extremely insightful because you, you learn all about how your, your, your debts get frozen and your assets become sort of this you know, non-linear, uh, dynamic, reflexive line item. <laughs> and when you get into industries that are cyclical or when you get into industries where the line items on the asset side of the balance sheet can uh, have asymmetry or convexity or things like that, you all of a sudden find that going bankrupt could be a blessing. Mm -hmm. And many times in my career, you know, starting again at like a very, very young age, I saw how these waterfalls would result in a situation where a company has no equity value and all of a sudden has tremendous equity value. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I made a lot of money doing this. Mm -hmm. And in other cases, I would see that there would be bankrupt equities where there was clearly no equity value to the point where a judge had already approved a bankruptcy reorganization process and investors were still stupidly buying the equity. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I've, I've, I've shorted equities where DTC was deleting the equity in 30 days <laughs> and investors were buying it at 30, 40 cents. And as long as you got, you know, the borrow, you still borrowed at 6%. So, that, so I've seen some really interesting things and I think that conditioned me to think as a contrarian, yep. you know, to the point where I started to question everything. The sky is blue, why? Explain. <laughs> and I guess it really goes back to my curiosity like all the way uh, since I was a child. But I think being a contrarian also imbued in me this sense of, I guess, first principles thinking, where when I try to analyze something, I'm not trying to appeal to any authoritative dogma or a theory or an axiomatic system. I'm trying to figure things out for myself um, the same way that a philosopher would, a natural philosopher. I'm just trying to figure things out. How does this work? How does that work? And it's not always a reductionist approach either. So the, the way I came to gold was, all of my mentors in finance hated gold. I was the guy that was in the value investing clubs, on the message boards, going to the annual meeting. I had, I had lunch with Warren Buffett twice. I've you know, met. And, <laughs> and you didn't have to pay for it? I, I didn't have to pay for it. It's, it's, it's actually a pretty good story the one time with Becky Quick. But, but the, the whole point is that everyone hated gold. Hated it. And I couldn't understand why. And all I knew was that their, their analysis for why they didn't understand gold always went back to it doesn't have a financial statement, it doesn't produce cash flow. And so it's in the too hard to decide bucket. And I found a lot of contradictory evidence, especially with Buffett, for him, in my view, knowing a lot more about gold than he let, let leads on, and, and as well with Munger. 
So for example, uh, one of the things that were pretty crucial for me was when I discovered that Berkshire Hathaway bought you know, six or seven percent of the world's silver in 1999. Mm -hmm. And in the press release that Berkshire Hathaway put out, Buffett quoted, I've been following the price of precious metals since their demonetization. And uh, you could still find this on Bloomberg. And so eventually he sold the silver position and he, I think, lost a little bit of money. But had he held that silver position, it would have been one of his best investments. He would have made like $100 billion. But the point is that if you, if you read <laughs> Howard Buffett's writings as a congressman, literally as a congressman, and if you read what Buffett would even used to say in some of the early BPL letters, there is this digression in thought where initially he seemed to understand gold and, and view it as, as, as money. And then at, a, at another point, he recognized that rather than being long gold as money, he could be long other assets that would benefit from structural inflation. I think that's what he ultimately did. But, but I, I digress a bit too. Um, so, so for me, it was starting to recognize that either people didn't spend enough time trying to understand gold, or they were just all making so much money within the system that it didn't matter to them. Mm -hmm. And I had other uh, interests aside from finance and like physics, and I kept finding that in, in the world of physics and geology and chemistry, gold was a very special element on its own account, just doing a first principles analysis based on scarcity, based on its properties and attributes, the most ductile of metals, the best conductor of energy, the only metal that doesn't oxidize or erode or rot or tarnish. And at some point, um, I began to recognize that the reason I was successful in the distressed world was because I really recognized the value of time when investing. And, and ultimately, um, you know, like you've had Josh here. So Josh is very much about the energy. And I totally agree with that. It's, all, it's a function of, it's a thermodynamic function of the economy, energy and entropy. But I sort of see time as the wrapper around mm -hmm. that. For me, it's always been about time. And I've always found that when you, when you go along something without an expiry date, a perpetual call option, you're always going to do OK. And in a fiat money economy, that's especially true. And when I began to see gold as being timeless, being something that not only is extremely scarce, so it can't be cheated, but also is the one thing that's timeless, that's when I began to sort of reconcile that understanding with my understanding of monetary history. And it happened at a great time for me, around 2006 and 7. So I started learning about this and realizing that the value investors were really, really good. And in fact, I, I do believe it's the best method for constructing a long, short portfolio of equities, working within that arena. Um, but when you try to take a step back and understand, well, why does a house go up? I'm looking at this thing. Mm -hmm. it, just, it looks the same to me. In fact, if anything, it's decaying. I have to keep fixing it. Why is, is it the house going up, or is there more money bidding the house up? And when you try to think about things like commodities or macroeconomics, value investing is not the right framework. You have to think about something else. And I think ultimately for me, I recognized it was all about money. And if I was going to understand money, I ultimately reconciled that gold was money. Whether we agree, whether we don't agree, it's got nothing to do with economics. It's, it's mm -hmm. part of the laws of nature of physics. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it, and, and you've actually had, if you look at a lot of what you'd consider modern value investors, because it's almost like you have to put them in two different buckets. You know, you go back to Graham and Dodd and you can say, okay, this is what value investing is and this is what it's always going to be. But the world's changed dramatically since those, I guess, rules were invented uh, or at least put into a textbook and people kind of become you know, fully bought in. Now I see, value, David Einhorn believes in gold. I mean, I'm pretty sure well, he's I, a I value I don't think investor. Benjamin Graham, if he was alive, in, I think he'd be turning in his, in his grave if he saw some of what's going on with money. I mean, his, his, <laughs> the, the, the premise for security analysis is a risk-free rate of interest. Right. I mean, you're always basing the decision off of the cost of money, the price of money, the signal of money, the measure of money. That's where I believe there is this sleight of hand in the intellectual tradition of value investing, mm -hmm. where you have these guys that are, you know, in my opinion, a little bit less rigorous just following what Buffett and Munger say. Mm -hmm. But you have other guys like Dalio, who isn't a value investor, but, but totally gets gold. Einhorn gets gold, but so does Paul Singer. Mm -hmm. Paul Singer gets gold, and he's a value investor. By the way, Seth Klarman, the, the, the author of Margin of Safety, gets gold. Mm -hmm. I've invested with, with him in gold mines in Colombia. Mm -hmm. So 
People get gold when they take a step back and try to understand what the hell is money, why do we need it, and what should it be? And when you take that approach, at least you get into this other debate about whether money should be fiat, an abstraction, or a tangible commodity. Mm -hmm. and, and when the argument goes there, at least you know someone's mind is, is, is on. Yeah. But when they just say things like Krugman, well, fiat money is you know, weapons, and th stupid things like that, the power to tax, and there, you, know, you know, it's actually funny. I, I, I was preparing for this interview, so I watched some of your, your videos. And the one that I found kind of by happenstance was, was you and Kudlow from like 2014. <laughs> and I watched the whole thing. It was really interesting. Yeah. And, I, and I just found this is a perfect example where you were so on it. And everything he was, you're like, well, look, there's inflation, the MIT project. And he's like, well, no, I can't really count that. And then you're like, well, the CPI is wrong. He's like, well, we're going to adjust it. And you say, well, you guys can't just adjust it. And at some point, he just turned to you and he said, listen, you want to make money or you want to talk about this stuff? And you're like, well, but you're wrong about all these things. And I think that's really where it comes down to is in this echo chamber of finance and economics and academic economics, at a certain level, people don't just don't want to admit that they haven't considered the policies of the last 40 years. It hasn't been well articulated in a book or a theory. There is no general theory of employment for QE or TARP. No one sat there <laughs> rigorous. A great point. <laughs> it's just been yeah. kick the can down the road, mm -hmm. almost like this ADD style, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna fix this and fix that. And we don't recognize that we've run over the cliff. And and I think that this is leading towards massive structural problems in our society that no one is, is, wants to recognize yet. And it's ultimately going to resolve itself through politics. Because, it, I mean, effectively you're saying that it delays actual learning, the finding of truth, because you're stuck with academic dogmas to some degree, or in other degrees, some people will fully admit, Roy, that they cannot change what it is that they believe or do because they've won a Nobel Prize and or that's how they get compensated. I, they've, they've admitted to me, some have worked for me. Uh, my fiance is an academic. She studies at Oxford, and she is a philosopher. She she pursues a, a, a realm of philosophy that's very contrarian, and she will not get sponsored by a P, for a PhD if she doesn't take the baton from the prior professor and advance that arrow of inquiry. She can't go back to the initial axiom mm -hmm. and say, "I want to change that," and that's really the problem with this walled garden of academia. It's this self-fulfilling feedback loops. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's been corrupted. And I think Peter Thiel talks about that a lot and other great thinkers. But again, the natural order, which is what I like to use a lot, resolves all of this. At the end of the day, people have to wake up in the morning, negotiate with nature, feed themselves, generate a surplus, and cooperate with fellow man. They don't care about what these guys are saying in academia. Really? They don't. <laughs> and, and if they try to take this theory, and as Taleb says, yes. fit it in a Procrustean bed, you know, it's not going to work, and it isn't working. And as you told him at one point in the color, you say, well, it's a chart. It's, it doesn't lie. It's a chart. It's a time series. Yeah, and, and <laughs> even then, he's like, well, I, I look at the yield curve or something like that. At a certain point, they're not going to be able to lie anymore. You know, you see what's happening in yeah. France. You see what's happening even in the United States. They're not going to be able to lie. If, if people can't feed themselves, pay for energy, pay for food, pay for clothing, pay for education, they're not going to subscribe to these theories anymore. And the, the magic here in all of this is the fiat money system. Yeah. Because the fiat money system conveys this share of societal wealth to these people in the power structure. Mm -hmm. And then they get reinforced to chase this carrot, whatever the latest theory is, uh, the, the R, R star or statistics of this. It's they, at a certain level, if you get them drunk, they know it's a bunch of BS. But they don't even have time to think about that. They, they generally believe that science... Nor do they, have, do they actually have the downside associated with being wrong on that on a, for, you know, on a, on a forward-looking basis. Like this year is a good example. People have had the macro environment wrong on many levels. You, know, you can be a billionaire today and have it, you can be down 20% year-to-date because your premise is starting to be proven to be wrong, literally wrong. I mean, if I look at the rate of change space and how to measure and map economies on a nonlinear basis as opposed to using some econometric model or some deterministic model, you know, use a stochastic model. Let's start with that. Or a Bayesian process. Let's change as the data changes. 
There are so many things, Roy, today that I, I almost wonder if this is the question. You started your company 10 years ago. Let's just round off the numbers. Yeah. I did too. We've been paid to teach ourselves the truth for a decade. If I don't come up with the truth, and I'm talking about a scientifically ordered or math and or mathematically or ordered process that people can test, process themselves, question, and then me have to evolve in kind, I certainly don't have all the answers. But why is it that I've come up with a process or you've come up with a process that's a better way? Is it because we started from a different point? History would say that timing matters in that regard. Well, when it, are you allowed to come up with new ideas? Uh, in my case, I actually think about this a lot because I actually believe that I know how to play the game. I know how to play the Keynesian long assets, short currency game. I've done very well doing it. I know the arena, I know the rules. But I believe that ultimately the killer instinct that's made me successful would allow me to be successful in any system. I know full well that in a gold standard, there will be severe deflation. Mm -hmm. That as we have productivity growth, prices come down. I know that I will be less rich relative to my maid and relative to my workers, but I don't care. I've never been purely motivated by money. <laughs> so I actually know that. And it's the, I think the, the issue with me is I came from nothing and most of my family is still extremely poor. So I see every day how my cousins and my uncles and my aunts and my grandparents, the social contract you know, has, been, has, has been violated. You know, they work for 30 or 40 years as a plumber, as a factory worker, as a farmer in construction, and they put away money believing that the money is something that will preserve its purchasing power. Mm -hmm. And when they reach the state of retirement, you know, Warren Buffett tells them, well, your quality of life is better. What are you worried about? And, and, and that's, a, that's a lie. You know, the quality of life isn't better either. And I've, I've written some papers about this. So to me, it's just been about, at first I worshiped all of this. And I believed, you know, I, I used to believe that the Keynesian economists and the Federal Reserve economists of 3,000 people that get paid whatever, $3 billion a year that they just print and pay them a salary. <laughs> they have a cafeteria just like here. Just think about it. They get to print the money and pay for stuff when they have a cafeteria or when they pay. So they don't take it from the treasury because they're using the base money. So they actually print money to pay salary. I, I just find that crazy. But and I've I, been to the New York Fed's cafeteria. I'm sure it's wonderful. Um, but I used to worship those people and think, you know, th these are the smartest guys. They've spent a lifetime reaching the point, and they genuinely believe that what they're doing is right. But I've come to recognize that there is an elitism, and, and there's, no, there's no sense of disquietude about what's going on and the causal factors. They, 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 they genuinely can't conceive that that the whole concept of wealth and debt is illusory and it can be forgiven. Mm -hmm. They're always working with this axiom, well, look how much debt we have. We can't let it deflate. We've got to inflate it away. It doesn't matter if that's going to result in the rich getting richer because they own all the assets and we've been doing this for 30 years, so they've been getting along ahead of us for 30 years because there's this thing called the trickle down, which never works. And, and I think the Gini coefficient shows this. I think Thomas Piketty shows this. So for me, I'm, I'm, I'm a conservative guy, but I, when it comes to economics, I think that a lot of what's being written on the, dare I say, uh, liberal left, uh, and even some of the uh, neo-Marxist thinking is correct in the sense that there, there has this, this, this pendulum has swung between capital and labor for so many years, and it's clearly on the side of capital now. And I don't believe that the reversion back is going to um, be uh, so easy. It's, 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 it's really going to have to result in real losses of purchasing power on the capital side. 100%. I mean, we have a chart where we quite simply show, going back to when you and I were born, which I think is a, an important period, just looking back, if you go back even 50 years, um, and we're just showing labor against corporate profits you know, mm. in the U.S. And what you'll note is that labor has never been at this level, this low level, in, you know, in, over the course of our lives. You know, labor had always been high and rising. Wage inflation is pro-cyclical and it would rise right into and during a recession. It would perpetuate a recession. So as you can, you can see in this chart, basically you effectively have a big red bar is appearing as wages are spiking. So what's happening there is now wages are competing with capital. 
And capital doesn't like that, especially if that capital is a debt security that depends on the cash flows of the underlying. So we're at a very unique point relative to what you just said. What you just said, if there is a breaking point that is to occur, it, we're already on the path of that point of entropy where labor shoots higher and the Federal Reserve cannot centrally plan and control labor wages down. They can control the dollar down. They can try to con control the illusion of inflation or the illusion of growth via inflation up. But they can't systematically eliminate or eliminate wage inflation. A recession eliminates wage inflation. So it would also almost have to be what it always is. The economic cycle itself shocks that and says, OK, now I'm going to go back to maybe a different place. But for now, we have profits up here, and we have labor down here. All-time highs is the spread between the two. And I don't, I, for the life of me, I, you, I don't think you have to be a, on the left or on the right to understand that. Back to the point to Cudlow. It's a time series. Yeah. That's where we are. That's why everyone is pissed off about it. That's well, why the social contract feels broken, because capital's getting paid and labor isn't. Exactly. And, and, you know, there's even things that are just even on the micro scale that haven't been properly covered, like this whole phenomenon of shrinkflation. You know, I know it's just this thing that we talk about, but it's, it's a real problem. Like mm -hmm. when you buy cereal today, it's smaller in weight and size, physical size, than yep. it was a year ago. And yep. the price is higher. Yep. And the CPI does not ac account for that. Yep. Um, so, so these are things that consumers see. I speak, I have 1.5 million customers at Gold Money. You know, I, if I go to a city and I say, hey, I'm going to be at this bar, 200 people show up and I get to talk to them. It's, it's kind of like a political thing. And I learn <laughs> from them and I see what they say and I see people's daily issues. And shrinkflation is something that has really bothered people yeah. because it's like Nestle and General Mills and all these companies are are laughing at the consumer. They're yeah. laughing at them. And so I agree with you. I, I think ultimately what this always comes back to is you have to have either a debt jubilee where you tear up all the, all the debt and, and that's where the conception of wealth is wrong. You know, this, this idea of, of the wealth we have today is so illusory. It's not really, the only thing that matters is people waking up tomorrow. You know, people wake up tomorrow, they want to cooperate. You know, the farmer wants to produce tomorrow, I need to brush my teeth tomorrow. That's the other thing, the, the boogeyman of the intellectual academic is, well, there's going to be a recession and all hell is going to break loose. I remember sitting with, uh, one of the biggest hedge fund managers of all time, I won't say the name, but you can figure it out, one of our early investors uh, in the Hamptons in his house. And I said to him, why are you so scared about deflation? Why? And he said, I don't want people revolting. You know, it's, it's this elitist belief that he is the philosopher king. He knows best. The people will revolt. I don't think the people will revolt if you cancel all the debts. They'll just wake up the next day and cooperate. They don't have the debts. They don't have Exactly. <laughs> that's the whole point. Well, that's, the, I mean, if you look at, I mean, a, a large, um, in any nonlinear system or any point of entropy that, that, that was born out of it, you have an imbalance. Yes. So what is the imbalance? I mean, right now today you have $8 trillion in corporate debt. Half of that is considered triple B or less junk. Triple B paper. What is triple B paper? I mean, a GE is the fulcrum credit. With, in the with a B fake world. interest rate like today, a yeah. fake real interest rate, it's it's not a real triple B in my opinion. The way so, I was taught. You so know? so who gets pounded if you take and and obviously the prior total of corporate debt was uh, sixty percent less of what it is today. Uh, if you want, I can tell you my view on that. It'll take a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> I need your view on this one. Okay. Well, so so I really people think that's safe. Well, I I have a problem with. As I've gotten older and wiser, I've, I have a problem with analyzing the economy using instant space mathematics because I, th I think the economy is fluid and it's simultaneous. Mm -hmm. So the flow is what matters more than the, the debt at any given point. Mm -hmm. And when you're, you know, it reminds me of that quote, all is flux, nothing stationary. You know, or, or Eric Clyde, not, you, you never step in the same river twice for you aren't the same man, it isn't the same river. Like, everything is always changing because of time. So the, the, the amount of debt outstanding relative to this industry or to that industry is not what matters to me. What matters to me is the rate of flow of earnings, if you want to use earnings, yep. or job growth, or energy surplus, mm -hmm. caloric energy, fuel energy, that that industry produces. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll give you a perfect example for this. Google is an incredible company, incredible. It's on the service layer of the economy. Incredible business, makes a ton of cash. 
But ultimately, Google employs, I believe, I might have the number wrong now, 50,000 humans. 50,000 humans depend on Google uh, for, their, for their labor, for their wage. Walmart employs 2 million people. Now, you can say, well, the people at Walmart don't get paid as much, and the people at Walmart you know, are getting subpar wages, et cetera. But the fact is, not only is Walmart paying 2 million people wages, but Walmart is also distributing food to the rest of society in a very complex way. Lots of important distribution points around, mm -hmm. around the world. So to me, the debt that Walmart has, if it even has debt, is not really relevant. Because the, the, the point in the economy that Walmart serves, both in terms of employing people and distributing food, is extremely sustainable. Mm -hmm. Now China, when they organize their economy in this socialist Marxist ideology, they think about things like that. They, they think about things like what I just mentioned. In a free market capitalist system, the way it was originally conceived and intended, money should have regulated the system such that you wouldn't have these asymmetries. Mm -hmm. But when the money is centrally controlled, artificially manipulated, suppressed, you have these regressive cycles. Yep. And in that cycle, it becomes very difficult to say, well, this eight billion of debt is, is bad for these guys or good for that guy. Who should we bail out? Well, we bail out the bankers. We know that. That's what happened in 08. I, I think there's a, a more revolutionary way to look at the economy in terms of it being simultaneous and trending to the future. What happened in the past is powerless. I don't care about the past. I care about the future. You know, Amity Shales wrote this book, The Forgotten Man. It's a great book. It's a great book. And it's all about how the most important thing for humans is to wake up in the morning and look to the future. That's what keeps them happy, whether it's their kin, kin altruism, or whether it's just something that's going to happen in the next mm -hmm. week or two. We could fix this economy by focusing on the future. Mm -hmm. And that's the other place where I disagree with the gold bugs. You know, the gold bugs' wet dream is <laughs> there's this much gold outstanding, and there's this much debt. Yeah. And if we re-rated that based on the pyramid, it would be 50000 an ounce. No. I don't care about how much gold's outstanding. I don't care about the price of gold. I care about that flow rate mm -hmm. of what's required to maintain the economy. Mm -hmm. And savings will emanate once we get back to this natural cycle. We don't even have real savings right now. You know, because the savings is in a bank deposit, which then is owed to the government. The government has its own problems. Mm -hmm. so, we don't really know anything. You know, I think if you speak to the smartest guys today in the world, like Drunkenmiller, like Dalio, like people like that, they will agree with, with me on this, that we don't really know anything. The price signal's all messed up. The numbers are all messed up. Certain companies have figured out how to play this game perfectly with the buybacks and the EPS growth. Rich people have figured out how to perfectly hedge their, themselves with art and luxury real estate and, and T-bills and things like that. But the average person, the, the, this, this sort of black hole is, is, is taking in more and more hostages. <laughs> and I think that's the, pe the, you yeah. know, the yellow vest people and that's the populace that voted Trump in. And I don't see that abating anytime mm -hmm. soon. No, that's where we agree 100%. I mean, the flow or in, 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 in hedge I, uh, nomenclature, the rate of change. Yes. And the rate of change will give you some point of entropy. It's mathematically impossible not to measure and map rates of change changing, which are always changing. And they don't always have to change the way that you'd like them to change. And that's the other thing. A lot of people have views that are siding towards where they'd like the world to go or where they need the world to go. Rates of change don't care. Rates of change in this case, I mean, if there's a lot of low quality debt, and that debt hinges on the basis of low cost labor and the rate of change of labor and wage inflation continues to accelerate and corporate profits, the rate of change starts to deteriorate, your point of entropy is about to occur. And on what order, who knows? I mean, it's, you don't know. You don't know. But what you do but, know but is But they that have control over it because they have these levers. So even if you start to get debt deflation, then they, then they rate, reduce interest rates mm -hmm. and then they go to QE and exactly. then they go, ner then they go NERP mm -hmm. or ZERP. The, the thing that I'm trying to say is that at a certain level, all you have is money, and the money should be allowed to flow like water. And if the money is flowing, then it goes to where it needs to go, mm -hmm. and, 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 and you start to see the productivity. But when you have this system, even if, like, they can even control, I don't really believe that this is the end of the system. I think that what you're going to see is a deflation, 
They're going to go back the other way with interest rates. They're going to go to QE. And then you're going to have people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez come up with UBI. The Silicon Valley uh, wizards love UBI. So I'm certainly going to see some form of UBI in the United States in my lifetime. And so they just keep taking it the other way. And I think it ultimately comes back to them genuinely believing that they're smarter than the populace. Mm -hmm. So, so in tropical the mathematics, they can still figure that part out. Well, they think they can. They think so they, they can. You know, but there comes a breaking point. So again, you're either of the belief that you weren't born to this earth to bend, you know, you know, bend the moon and <laughs> part the heavens and, and, and reorder the seas, or you do believe that you can do that. So if you are seeing a deflation and you're effectively saying, no, I'm going to create a dam here, and I'm going to print money there, and I'm going to get inflation back over here. There's no, there is no reason to believe that that's, that has to end well all the time. Well, you know what the key to this is, is, is the dollar. See, ultimately, the vulnerability in this whole plan, and we are seeing signs that the game theory is changing around this, is the twin deficits, the mm -hmm. budget deficits, the budget deficit and the trade deficit. Because so long as the dollars have to be created, if there is a moment where the rest of the world doesn't play that game and U.S. loses that hegemony, yep. then you'll get the hyperinflation. See, the hyperinflation is supposed to bring the pendulum back to labor, too. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to help so that they can't put up those dams. But surprisingly, since 08, we haven't had the hyperinflation in the U.S., which is why gold hasn't well, gone. Well, that's a, that's a real important topic because, I mean, this is, this is a good year, for example, where you know, for better or worse, it's still my job to try to get the market right and time it right. And a big misnomer was that the dollar was doomed. We're at the beginning of the next phase. People, the biggest net long position in the history of the euro. Okay, and it's not like the U.S. is unique with twin deficits. I mean, that's another thing that people forget is that if you're going to start talking about the dollar, we have to start talking about the ECB's monetary policy. For sure. The BOJ's been. So it, you have to have a global macro process to, again, uh, attempt to understand what could be going on. And what happened, I mean, until determined otherwise, the dollar is the world's reserve currency. So when the Argentine peso collapsed, the Brazilian real went down 10%. This was all a function of their economy slowing. Their monetary you know, plan was ask for an IMF bailout in Argentina. It's amazing. But can, you say, can in, you say in good faith, though, that the dollar, the, the rate of change of the dollar's share of the global hegemony of foreign currency reserves isn't slowing? No, 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 not at all. But the rate of change of the economies that had an alternative currency that was liquid and people had a choice. Like you yeah. say, you wake up in the morning, you either want to buy more Argentine pesos and dollars or you want to sell them. The, all these decisions had to be made and these decisions are also rate of change based. Sure. So again, central, banner, central banker is going to go dovish and try to devalue the currency in response to a slowing economy and or slowing inflation. We know that. Yes. That's the entire, I mean, you can be at the Bank of South Korea and have gone to Harvard, or you can be oh, at the sure. Fed and having gone to Harvard. Yeah. You have the same playbook. Yes. So th when that happened all at the same time, the world slowed while the U.S. was still accelerating. We had tax reform. They did not. The relative trade into the U.S. dollar, and this was actually bad for gold in the first part of the year, less so now, didn't care about the twin deficits in the moment. The water went out of for sure. where it needed to. And, and the other thing that happened was Bitcoin. People thought that when we started to have a, the next emerging market currency crisis, which clearly we had this year, you would be buying Bitcoin yeah. instead of dollars. Yeah. Where did that go? Like, I mean, that's another, I mean, there's so many things that we could talk about. Yeah. There, but the dollar really de facto in the intermediate term, I'm not saying it is long term. I, I've gone both ways on this. Well, I, I would argue, though, that a lot of that happened, though, because interest rates went up in dollar terms. So, yes, so, so, I agree with that. So remember when, the, Ni remember when the Nigerian central banks wrote a letter to Jerome Powell to stop raising rates because it was causing all the corrupt politicians to not have any Nigerian Naria anymore. Yeah. So they, had, they were moving it out. But look, it's clear. I totally agree with you that the twin deficits are kind of like a melting ice cube. It takes time. Yep. But I would, if we had more time, I would argue that there are rising powers, whether it's China or Russia or other countries, that don't have as bad of a hole in their ship, in their, in their dynamic system, that if they get their, their stuff together, uh, you could see an issue. Now, I'm not going to use this in a, as an example because it's a, not a great one, but it is interesting that this year the Russian, ex, the Russian index is up. 
in dollar terms, mm -hmm. and all other indices are down. And Russia is a country that has a very large reserve of gold, runs a budget surplus and a trade surplus, and has very low debt to GDP. Um, and, and, yep. the, and the same is true for China. And even a country like India, and in India you also have about a trillion dollars of gold being adorned and worn in, in the country, which isn't on any official, official numbers. So the, the, the issue, I guess, for me is if the United States f uh, sees the deflation coming and begins to lower rates, the dollar loses its comparative advantage over that. other currencies, at which case you can start to see Mm -hmm. a hyper or a you know, 1970s style inflation. Uh, and it could also coincide with um, people discovering that the, the decline rates in fracking are very high and there isn't as much fracking reserves as people think. And that would then elicit this political reform that mm -hmm. you and I were hoping for earlier. All things being equal, if the US retains its intellectual hegemony, then you're right. The guys in Harvard and all these other countries make sure almost that the US can still play with it and hopefully you get growth. I mean, I'm not a bear, you know, I, I don't want to see things materialize negatively. I, mm -hmm. I, if there is a way to grow <laughs> out of this or inflate out of this, I would love to see it. But I would need to see indicators that would um, transcend just economics. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, economics to me are, are not the only signals I'm looking for. I'd need to see an end to shrinkflation. I'd need to see real, yep. you know, s s g growth in productivity, mm -hmm. you know, real growth in productivity yeah. and sustained wages, you know, again, uh, fertility rates, scenario, uh, right? you know, so people my that. age aren't having babies, mm -hmm. you know, they're not forming households. I'd like to see a higher uh, household formation rate yeah. than I'm seeing today. And all those, those longer term decisions. And again, I love your point that, you know, God willing, we get up two feet on the floor every morning and that's the future. I mean, that's, yeah. people are making that decision every day. Neil Howard, demographer shows this every single time he gives a presentation. And it really is shocking and somewhat sad that mortality rates, fertility rates, everything's going to an extent the wrong way. Yeah. And that's, these are long-term trends that are hard to turn around. There's certainly no central banker that has a plan for that. They know how to devalue the dollar, cut interest rates, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they're not signed on for that. They don't even believe <laughs> that the causation links that effect to their decision. Well, I mean, it, it took, Ben Bernanke couldn't handle two back-to-back -back questions at a dinner table with David Einhorn without getting uncomfortable and not willing to talk. Yeah, no, it's incredible. I've, I've spent time with him, too, in person, and he's, he's completely useless mm -hmm. uh, as, as a thinker. I mean, he just has this paradigm that he understands and he believes, even the way he interprets the Great, the great Depression, in my opinion, is wrong. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, these people are... You know, I think Jim Rickards once said it best. It's like, if you talk to them about, you know, anything other than what they know, it's like they ask where are the potato chips. Yeah, it's, <laughs> like, it's, it's amazing. That's the problem. And, and, I, and no one in politics recognizes that you can't defer your decisions to these people. No. You know? I mean, well, because it's, it's classic. I mean, it's, it's the ivory tower. It's the received wisdom. It's the establishment. And the good news is that somebody like, I mean, even if you look at the, 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 the what, did we, what did Niall Ferguson call his most recent book, The Square and the Tower. Mm. You know, you, so you have some prolific academics that, you know, do have uh, a voice that are starting to speak this way and challenge the received wisdom. But my guess is that they're probably going to be in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. They're not your 60 to 80 year old economists. I have a more dire picture actually for you. Because I've spent a lot of time now in Oxford and these places, the, the academic uh, professors that I've been meeting in economics that are rising through the ranks are actually um, socialists. Really? They, they believe that capitalism has that. failed <laughs> and they believe in UBI. Oh, and this is the best one. Well, this is a millennial view. Yeah, and they, they believe that automation and robotics will eventually uh, lead to us not needing jobs. And so we should begin to plan for uh, obsolescence. Well, if, you, if you're, in your, if you're, you're trying to become a PhD in your, your early 30s, you are a millennial. Yeah. You're not a millennial, are you? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm 33. Oh, yeah. you're late? Yeah. I mean, so I, I'm Gen X. We're the yeah. screwed up ones. Yeah. You know, the Gen X population has worked, like been gainfully employed, again, uh, so to speak, throughout the last two economic crises. That's what they know. Totally. I mean, if you're in your early 40s, that's what you know. Every five to 10 years, it blows up. You get your deflation. Yes. And then you get your monetary policy response. 
and then you get raging bull markets or throughout that period you're discounting a raging bull market and things like gold, people start to feel differently about what they used to feel. And that's, you know, that's a big open question. Are we on the beginning of another one of those? A lot of people think that that's not possible. Uh, this year you've gone from a globally synchronized recovery to now the Fed. Pretty much you know, people are trying to discount that there will be no more rate hikes and the next move will be rate cuts. I mean, that's not what other people are saying, but I would not be surprised uh, to find that in, in our own now cast of what is happening. So we're kind of right back at the same place again. And for a Gen X person, like fool me once, okay, twice, eh, maybe lost all my money that time, what about a third time? Is it our own biases that have us uh, concerned about this or is it the flow? I, I think that you and I are still relatively well off in this equation, no matter how this turns out. And the, the issue is that if you could truly conceive of how poor the average person is. The average person mm -hmm. in the United States doesn't even have $2,000 in their bank account. Mm -hmm. And what it's all being fed by is this debt-based consumerism. So, so there's this con consumer economy fueled by debt, and then there's these 50 million people, I believe, who get the handouts in some way, the transfer economy, and then you've got the older people on the Social Security. But there's only like probably 20 million people that are doing okay, and then there's probably like 50,000 people like me and you. And, and everyone else, and literally it's that little, it's like 50 or 100,000 families. Isn't it amazing? Yeah, because you know how you can back it out? You know, all the census data is BS. Just go to like Zillow, or go to MLS.com or Trulia, and do a search for how many houses are over $5 million in various cities around the United States that you would think and you'll see it's not a lot, or how many houses get sold for over five million. It ends up being a handful of people. You just hear about them all the time. There's this <laughs> thing called the Dunbar number, so you think there's yeah. all these rich people, and then Forbes uses it. Well, Forbes does it okay, but they, they, there's a lot of paper wealth in there, but uh, there's a company called Wealthex, and they, or Capgemini, they say there's this many people with over five, and if you read how they do it, they didn't count all the people. They use something called the Lorenz curve. Mm -hmm. So they put a bunch of inputs from Forbes, and then they see the rate of change between, say, Bezos to Buffett, and then they assume that the guy that has 50 million, there's X amount of people that have 10 million. But that's not how things work. The guy that got the 10 million may have worked 10 times harder than the guy that made 100 million, and the guy that made 100 million sold a private equity firm at the top at a multiple. <laughs> so there actually aren't that many more rich people as you go down from those 1,000 people on Forbes that have a billion to, say, the people that have 10 million. It's just that you keep seeing them all the time and hearing about them all the time. And, and the number is actually, in my view, closer to like 50,000 or 100,000. And once you get there, and once you've met everyone, and once you've seen everyone, you realize that there's another 100 million people that you run into, if you just went out on the street, that are barely surviving. They're barely surviving. So it's ultimately those people that are gonna decide what to do in the future, not mm -hmm. us. We're trying, you know, people like us in Agnew are trying to hold on, but those people, now the problem is that those people are angry. They're angry, and, and, and what they ultimately decide, that's why I like the idea of a debt jubilee, because, because the debt jubilee can help them. And you know, this goes back to like ancient Mesopotamia. Whenever a new ruler would come into office, the first thing you do is tear up the old debts. There was a party. It was called the Debt Jubilee. And it worked very well in France. I see you have one of those uh, rooms over there celebrating the revolution. But you, you, people have to start thinking about this. The economists have to start thinking about the sociological aspects of this. And you know, what I've been trying to do with gold money and, and with the new jewelry brand with Monet is I still am naive enough to think that people do care about liberty mm -hmm. and self-actualization and self-enrichment. Uh, and I, I think this can be solved through gold. If, if, if people, even in your own interview with Kudlow, he said, well, we could peg the price back to gold at 1200. I was, you know, it's pretty cool to hear him say that. But if we went back to a gold standard, it would, and, and did something with the past debts, we would instantly, the rich people would be poor, real estate prices would decline big time. On, on an adjusted basis, but so would the cost of everything else. And the next day, day two, after we woke up the next day, everyone would feel far richer. And then you would hopefully get back to that 1776 to, two, nine, to sorry, 1914 mm -hmm. style American Republic where there is this small government but you know, very, very liberty-based self-cooperation and actualization. And, 
I think that can happen. We've been trying to do it with gold money by building the digital gold bank and showing people they can live in gold and it does work and you know, it works much better in other currencies where gold's going up every year. Um, but we're, we're just trying to teach people that again, that, that this ultimately comes back to your measure, how you measure your productivity. Yep. And you know, if you measure it with this tangible element gold, then you ultimately at least have control. Mm -hmm. You have self-control. If you're deferring that decision to the government or to politicians or to academics, then you're just a, a mouse on a pinwheel. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not really in control. And that's what I hope happens. Yeah, and how about the, I mean, uh, maybe a little bit of time on the jewelry component to that. Mene, you, you, granddaughter of Pablo Picasso, or do I have the yes. lineage right? Okay. Yes. So that's who you've partnered with, and that's a new business. But you're, you're applying the same principles in terms of what you think the value is and starting there? Yeah, so the thing that always uh, perplexed me was they always say gold standard started in Lydia in 1700 uh, BC uh, when King Croesus coined uh, a coin of gold. And when I read history and I would do this research, I would always see you know, the word gold and silver and gold and silver going back you know, to Hammurabi 2,000 years earlier. Yeah. So I wonder, well, what were they using if they weren't using, you know, because they were weighing it. And, and the answer is that for most of human history, the, the gold standard was actually a gold jewelry standard. Mm -hmm. the, the gold, when you find it in nature, it's the element AU. It's not 18 karat or 14 karat. That's a chemical alloy. It's a man-made mm -hmm. invention. That's interesting. There's just one kind of gold, real pure yeah. gold. That's how you find it in nature. They would just take that pure gold and they would mold it into a ring, into a bracelet, into mm -hmm. an earring. And that was their money. So they would go and they would weigh it. And because it was pure 24 karat gold, it could be weighed easily. And the, it had an objective value. So that way of, of consuming jewelry or buying jewelry, jewelry is an investment. I call it investment jewelry. It's still alive and well in the East. It's how $100 billion a year of jewelry is purchased every year. And there's about $2 trillion of jewelry, gold jewelry being worn that way. Mm -hmm. And when I started gold money, I started noticing that because you know, we're one of the largest precious metals custodians. We have about $1.5 billion of precious metal assets, 35 tons. We also trade a lot of metals. So a lot of counterparties come to us, big banks, say, I need you know, 10 kilos, 100 kilos right now at this vault yeah. or at that vault. And one of the things I would notice was a lot of the big jewelry brands you know would come to us to buy some metal, gold or platinum at you know, various points of the year. And I would study their business models and I'd see how Tiffany or you know, Pandora or Cartier would just buy this gold from us and then sell it for you know, 700 or 1,000 percent markup. And I thought, just a well, marginal markup. Yeah, yeah, I thought this is a pretty good business. I'm sitting here making half a percent and they're turning, you know, just, there's no diamond or gem on it. So there's nothing that would cause you to say, well, yeah, but they did this. or They just took the metal, turned it into a ring and sell it. And I thought, could I do this? Could I build a brand that would sell you know, jewelry, and, and after I studied the, um, the history of the, of, the, of the jewelry industry, I wrote a paper called The Gold Jewelry Standard, and Josh and I actually traveled to India and China, and we spent three weeks there, and we did in-depth, you know, research, scuttled about real research, and we said, we're going to take this ancient tradition of jewelry, and we're going to bring it to the West again, oh, cool. and we're going to make a direct consumer luxury brand. We called it Manet, and I partnered with Diana Picasso, who's the designer, and we've been absolutely killing it. It launched in January of this year. Uh, we've sold close to $10 million of jewelry online. The, the way it works is there's thousands of items, charms and necklaces and all this stuff, but the price changes every day. So whatever the price of gold is, that's the price. And our premium is always 20%. Oh, so cool. if you buy something for $500, you have 400 on your wrist, and 100 is our profit. So you're, 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 the value of what you purchase floats. Yes, and you can track the value like a stock. What you paid for it, you can see the percentage return. You can sell it back whenever you want. You, can, you, you have that oh, on yeah. the platform? Yeah, we built a whole fulfillment center in New Jersey in the airport where we can take back like old jewelry and sell it back. It's a whole concept. It's a very, very, I mean, it's what I've been doing for, you know, I haven't been talking about economics. I've been doing, <laughs> this is my day job, you know, is I build these businesses. So this was the business I've been building um, for two years. And we, we just launched it. We just finished a $30 million funding round. and. You know, it's, 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 a, it's incredible business because believe it or not, the jewelry industry is a $300 billion annual industry. Oh, I believe it's, that. It's 
twice the size of the digital ad market that Google and Facebook. It's a, everyone buys jewelry. So how quick can I get something? You know, you got, I don't have much, much time on the clock in December here. You go to Monet.com yeah. and you can buy something. You'll have it in three days. So three days. Make it for the holidays. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Because I used to go to Tiffany. Yeah. And Pablo Picasso's got that big Paloma market. Picasso. That's Paloma. her aunt. Correct. Yeah. Oh, her aunt. That's, that's Diana's aunt. So you see how yeah. much I know yes. what I was well buying? Yes, well done. I don't know. Of I course. Mean, no, actually, I didn't know. That. I mean... It, all you wanted, or particularly before we got married, was I wanted to have that damn blue box, you know, with something in there that she probably liked, and, and she turned. We have there. a blue box too, and it's better. And people people claim it's it's made by the same factory that makes Chanel's box. So what what would be the difference if I was to buy the same thing? Uh, what's the difference in the markup so, at Tiffany so versus? So if Manet? you were to buy something from Tiffany's today for a thousand dollars, and you went and melted that down it would have about $100 of intrinsic metal value. Oh, wonderful. If you buy something from me for $1,000, you'll have $800 of intrinsic metal value. Moreover, if you place the alloy, the highest quality gold that Tiffany sells is 18 karat, which means 76 or 78% gold, and 20, 32% whatever of nickel and zinc and copper, that's no longer pure gold. Pure gold looks different, yep. feels different. It doesn't oxidate, doesn't tarnish and it's antimicrobial. It kills bacteria on touch. You literally don't get sick when you wear pure. That's why the ancients wore gold everywhere. So, you know, it's why when they were mining for oil, they'd drop a, a gold coin in, in, the, in a glass of water from the river and they drink it. You know, there's things people used to know, ancient wisdom. But she will, you know, if you, we've had thousands of reviews since we launched. And one of the main things people say is, I couldn't believe how pure gold feels compared to the alloy. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, talk about the most basic level of education. That's, that's fantastic. And, yep. and you're, I mean, I got to say, I've had a lot of discussions on, on Real Conversations. You can go anywhere with depth and specificity like almost no one I've sat across from before. So thank you for educating you. all of, yeah. anyone who's watched this is probably like, oh my God, who's this guy and where'd he come from? Um, but thanks for taking an interest in that because a lot of time I meet people on Wall Street and they say to this, they, I get this question all the time, a hey, hedge eye is a great idea, but if you're good at this, why don't you go run money? And I say, I say the same thing that you said. Money's not the only thing that, again, gets me up in the morning. Building a company is quite interesting and it's quite fascinating. It's a lot about people. And if you like people, it seems like you love people. You want yeah. people to do really well. Exactly. And look at the things you're building. It's well, awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. I mean, I, I'll say Wall Street is such an amazing place to educate young people about hard work, rigor, waking up in the morning. When I was an intern, I had to be at a 5 a.m. meeting every day. <laughs> you know, in the tech world, I'll tell you, they don't work that hard. <laughs> um, and, and I love the idea of self-evident truth. On Wall Street, you know, everyone ultimately agrees. You get rated, you get ranked. There is that intellectual rigor. But at a certain level, you can take that model and that psychological process and you can apply it in other realms. Building great yeah. companies. Yeah. Well, thanks, Roy, and congratulations. Thanks a lot. I yeah. appreciate it. Thanks for having me again. I appreciate it. He's Roy Sabaga. You can find him. He's got a Twitter handle. You can see it right there. You can also see uh, goldmoney.com and Mene, all of the fun things that he's, not just fun things, fascinating things that he's built.